we read about the various fetters that are abandoned in the practice, and there's a temptation to want to reason our way past them. But that's not how the practice works. It works by a process of cause and effect. The fetters are abandoned as the effect of the practice, not as the effect of reasoning things through. We practice virtue, concentration, discernment, and that practice in turn is dependent on developing certain factors like heedfulness, conviction, desire. Because the path itself needs to be put together. It's a fabricated thing, and there has to be a desire to do it. If we don't have any desire, we don't fabricate things. It's one of those truths of the will, where it's not going to happen unless you want it. Wherever there's a desire, there's going to be becoming, and becoming involves the sense of self. But what the path needs is a skillful sense of self. The Buddha talks about this quite a bit. And the self is its own mainstay. In other words, you have to depend on yourself. If you don't depend on yourself, who are you going to depend on? Who can do the work for you? Because it's not a case where someone's going to come and save us from ourselves. We have to figure out where we're being unskillful. And that's one of the definitions of avicca and the cause of suffering, is a lack of skill. We're being unskillful, and what we can do to get past it. We have to depend on ourselves, because we're the ones who are being unskillful, and so we have to undo our lack of skill. Nobody can give us a skill. We have to learn it. And so as with any desire, there's going to be your sense of self as the producer and the self as the consumer. The producer is the one who can do this. The consumer is the one who's going to enjoy the results. As for the self as a producer, we have to have the confidence that we can do this. This comes in in this discussion one time of how we need conceit in order to get past conceit. The conceit that other people can do this, they're human beings, I'm a human being, why can't I? That's a good sense of self. You need that. You have to have that kind of confidence, otherwise you can't do the path. Or you think that nirvana is off someplace else. A lot of us here think that nirvana is over in Thailand. Jean Fung was telling me he was a little kid and he thought nirvana was up in the Himalayan mountains. And you can imagine what the people in the Himalayan mountains think, someplace else. It's something we can attain through our efforts right here. Someone else once asked me, where's the best place to practice? And I said, right where you are. This is where things are going to be found. So you have to have that confidence, which is how conceit is needed on the path. You can't let go of it right away. You have to think that you're capable of this. And then, of course, self as a consumer, there's the passage where the Buddha talks about the self as a governing principle. He's got three governing principles for ways to think when you're beginning to get tempted to leave the path. One is the world as a governing principle, realizing that there are beings in the world who can read your mind. What are they going to think? when you're getting ready to give up. Then there's the Dharma as a governing principle, realizing here's an excellent Dharma. It's very rare that we find a true Dharma like this. So here's our chance to practice. If we don't practice now, when are we going to get another chance? Then there's self as a governing principle, which is that if you remind yourself, I got on this path because I wanted to put it into suffering, and if I get off this path, if I stop, or if I get la lazy and lax, do I really love myself? So here you are thinking about yourself as the consumer of the results of the path. And it's something you want to hold in mind. Don't be afraid of having a desire to practice. Don't be afraid of building up a self around this. I was once reading a, a monk saying that concentration and effort require 
a strong sense of will, a sense of motivation. Motivation requires a sense of self, and we all know that Buddhism is against a sense of self, so we got to not do concentration, not do right effort, which is getting all, everything all backwards. You use the sense of self, a healthy sense of self, until you don't need it anymore. Then you naturally drop it. Even the beginning of wisdom starts with the question, what when I do it will be to my long-term welfare and happiness? Now you've got the self as the producer and the self as the consumer right in there. What makes it wise is you want the long term and realize that it's going to have to depend on your actions. And so you try to find an answer to that question. You look at your own actions. Where are you causing suffering? Can you stop? Can you be more skillful in your actions? When you're doing concentration, it's the same sort of thing. When the mind gets settled down, is it really as still as it could be? Is there still some disturbance in here? Look around. See what you're doing that's causing the disturbance, because it's the mind that's causing the disturbance. The Buddha devotes a whole sutta. They're just getting the mind in concentration, settling in, indulging in it, as he says, which means that you let yourself enjoy it for a while. Don't be afraid of enjoying the concentration. Don't listen to those people who put up warning signs all over jhana saying that, you know, watch out, watch out, dangerous. The Buddha never put warning signs, he never cordoned it off. He said, this is something you want to do. And if you're going to be attached to the pleasure, okay, this is a much better pleasure to be attached to than not having this pleasure to be attached to, because then you're just going to go back to your old ways, looking for pleasure and sensuality. So you learn how to enjoy the pleasure, but without losing your focus. This is one of the practices you do in order not to be overcome by pleasure nor, be, nor overcome by pain. What little pains are on the body, you learn to work through them. As for the pleasure, you don't let the pleasure absorb all of your attention. When you're with the breath, you don't leave the breath. So it's learning how to be with pleasure, sometimes very intense pleasure, and yet not focus on the pleasure itself. You keep, keep your eye on the breath. Stay with the breath. It's like that image the Buddha gives of the man walking in the, in the crowd. He's got a bowl of oil in his head. There's someone following right behind him. With a sword raised. And if a drop of oil falls from the bowl, the man with the sword is going to cut off the guy's head. And on one side there's a huge crowd, on the other side there's a beauty queen singing and dancing. And the crowd is singing, the beauty queen is singing, and the beauty queen is dancing. And if he lets himself get distracted either way, he's going to die. Well, it's the same with the concentration. It's not you're going to die if you get into the start wallowing in the pleasure, but you lose your focus, and your concentration gets less and less alertness. Sometimes you sit here for a while, and it's a nice, kind of a nice buzz, but then you come out and you don't have any sense of where you were. Okay, that's concentration lacking alertness. That's delusion concentration. So you learn how to be with the pleasure, but not, not, over, not overcome by the pleasure. And then you can ask yourself, is this as still as it could be? Is there something in here that's still a disturbance to the mind? And you look for that. And you see what you're doing, what perception you're holding in mind. And as you work with it, you go into deeper, deeper, deeper stages of concentration. Because basically what you're doing is asking yourself the questions of the Four Noble Truths. Where is the suffering? Where is the stress? In this case, it's very subtle. So it's, hard, it's hard to call it suffering, but it is stress. What's causing it? What can you do to let it go? You keep up this process and you finally do get to something in the mind that's deeper than concentration. You can actually touch the deathless inside. Now, because you've gotten used to 
seeing how the mind fabricates states. You recognize this for something that's not fabricated. You know that you didn't do it. But the fabrication of the path got you there. When you have that experience, then you come out of it. And coming out of it, that's where the fetters get cut. The very first time around, it's uncertainty. You're no longer uncertain about what the Buddha taught. You've experienced what he taught. And he, as he said, there really is a deathless, and you found it. There's no holding on to teachings about the self, because what, however you could define a self would have to be around the five aggregates, and you've had an experience that had nothing to do with the five aggregates at all. There's not even any desire to want to define yourself in any way as, as a separate self, or a connected self, or a finite self, or an infinite self, a cosmic self, whatever. There's no desire to define yourself. And then finally, there's no clinging to precepts or habits and practices. In other words, your virtue is mastered. And what does it mean not to cling to it? It doesn't mean that you don't hold to the precepts anymore. It's just that the precepts are part of your behavior now. And you don't have to build any sense of self around it. There's no fashioning of a sense of self. Or you're not sila maya. You are not fashioned of your precepts. In other words, you're virtuous, but there's no sense that you're better than other people because you're virtuous, or you look down on other people. You're not defining yourself in terms of your virtue. But what you're still holding on to, though, is the practice of concentration and discernment. And that's where a sense of lingering self is still there. There still has to be a little bit of conceit around that. Otherwise, it's not going to get mastered. So it's not that we can make up our minds, okay, I'm going to abandon this fetter today and then let's work on the next fetter tomorrow. You're cooking the mind, as the John's saying. In John Lee's image, you're putting a piece of rock in a smelter. And as the heat gets higher, then the different metals in the rock begin flowing out. First there's the tin, then there's the lead, then there's the zinc, then there's the silver, then there's the gold as the heat gets higher and higher. You can't pick these things out of the rock. All you have to do is put the heat of your effort on the mind, keeping after the mind when it's causing any sense of stress or suffering or disturbance. Okay, we figured out what's going, what's going on. That's the heat. And then the good things start showing themselves. So the way we test the Buddhist teachings is right here, in our concentration, and in asking the right questions. As for the things that get abandoned, they get abandoned based on experiences that will, have, that will come when you subject the mind to the right practice. So focus on the causes, and the results will take care of themselves. The path is something fabricated. It leads to something unfabricated. It doesn't cause it, but it leads you there. Without the path, you can't get there at all. So focus on what you're doing right now. Be really sensitive about what you're doing right now, because it's your sensitivity that's going to allow you to see where there's stress that you didn't notice before, and what's coming along with the stress, what's causing it. It's not just a matter of repeating formula. It's a matter of learning to be sensitive to what you're doing and the results of what you're doing. And as you get more and more sensitive, things will start showing up that you didn't see before. And in that direct experience, you find that the results come on their own without you having to know about them beforehand.